Thank you for joining us. I'm Tom Foley, the president of Mount Aloysius College. Uh, we're here to enjoy the fifth of our digital grotto conversations um, coming to you live from the college. We're happy to have with us today uh, Dr. Tim Shriver. Um, he's most recently known uh, for a book uh, that was, uh, the last time I checked, number two in this category on the New York Times bestseller list. I don't know if he was aware of that, on educational offerings, fully alive, discovering what matters most. Uh, lots of folks know Tim because he is the leader of the International Special Olympics, uh, where he succeeded his mother, Eunice Shriver. Um, uh, many people know Tim because he spent the first 15 years of his career uh, um, advancing uh, the knowledge base in a very practical way on what we refer to as social and emotional intelligence in this country. And Tim is, is still now the chair of the leading research uh, entity on that. Um, today, we really want to try to focus uh, on Tim's book. So let me start by just welcoming Tim and congratulating him on the book um, and on the life. Thank you. Um, if, if I uh, hit you hard, Tim, and said, uh, tell me in a paragraph uh, what the book is about, what would you say? Well, I think it's about finding uh, in unlikely places uh, the secrets to feeling most fully alive. I mean, the title is an invitation. It was a, a tantalizing invitation to me. Uh, I thought to myself, if I knew the answer to that question, how to feel fully alive, how to be fully alive, how to... Uh, trust that I was fully alive, not waiting for something else, not trying to get someplace else, but being fully alive. Um, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that the people who had taught me the most were very unlikely people, people who we don't think of as teachers. We think of them as victims. We think of them as uh, causes. We think of them as charitable, uh, uh, needy people. And yet it was those same people who gave me these, uh, I'd say, quite unlikely lessons in how to be fully alive. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, it's fabulous, Tim. The, I, I want to say at the start, um, uh, Tim has done interviews, and anybody watching this that wants to know more about the book uh, or about how Tim discovers how to be fully alive, I absolutely commend, uh, look up and watch the interview that Tim did with Oprah. Um, Tim did an interview with Scott Simon on NPR that's especially good. Um, he also did an interview at the JFK Library, and they cover some of the issues we'll cover here, but many more, and I really want to recommend If you watch folks. all three of those, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I, I recommend them to you for another reason. I, I want to take a, maybe a little bit different tack, because I know what fundamentally the book is about. But uh, at the moment that I finished reading it, I, um, I, I texted Tim, um, and I thanked him, and the phrase that I put in there was, uh, you found Rosemary. And Tim... Um, texted back and said, thank you for the insight about the find. But it occurred to me, you really weave four or five different stories um, in the course of this book. And I'd like to spend a few minutes on each of them. Um, the stories as I identified them, Tim, um, and you can tell me, boy, you're, you're full of it. It's really not about that at all. I felt clearly a big part of the book is about your experience in the Special Olympics with special people. Um, I thought some of the book was about your mother. Um, I read uh, the book your brother wrote about your father, um, uh, which was terrific as well. Um, but I really, I mean, I feel like I knew your mom, and I did. Um, your mom, whether you knew it or not, used to invite me over to your home when you weren't around, and I was in Washington. But your mother was a fabulous person. I'm not sure anybody's really done her bio. I thought, third, the book was a lot about your own faith journey, um, which I know you began way back when we first met. And I thought that some of your insights there were profound. Fourth, of course, I felt the book was a little bit about Rosemary. And lastly, and not the least important, the book is about your own family um, and how you and Linda have grown and raised that family. Uh, but maybe we start with, with uh, the Special Olympics. Um, and, and I want to start with uh, something. We just had a lovely rendition of a poem by Seamus Heaney. Um, you quote it in your book. Um, and I'm going to read just from the book. Uh, these are your words, Tim. In a later poem, Seamus Heaney wrote, of a drive along the Irish shore and the beauty of the inland swans and the color of the sea and the movement of the light on the stones. As he paused to take it in, he realized it was just a moment. Um, and you and Michelle were just reciting those words. You have a few of them in here. Um, you are neither here nor there. This is Heaney speaking a hurry through which known and strange things pass, 
as big soft buffetings come at the car sideways and catch the heart off guard and blow it open. You tell that you use those words um, in a part of the book where you're talking about a young Special Olympian uh, named Donald. Can you tell us a little bit about that story and what do you think was the gift that Donald gave to you? Well, Donald Page uh, is uh, one of eight children. His, ma his dad is a dairy farmer. Uh, as he told me, I said, do you make cheese? Do you? He says, no, I just do the raw material. Uh, and nice. as I spoke to him on the phone, his dad, uh, to, to interview him to, to research the book, I could hear cattle in the background. Um, uh, Donald was a healthy little baby boy and uh, at about 18 months or so uh, became ill one night. It was actually Good Friday and uh, fever spiked and they took him to the hospital and they gave him the last rites of the church uh, because he was clearly uh, uh, about to die. He survived the night and then again the next day became uh, deathly ill and again was given the last rites of the church and survived and this went on uh, for almost a year. Um, his mother caring for him as he became increasingly uh, wounded by these bouts with, with a very serious illness. Um, when it came time 18 years later for the Special Olympics World Games to come to Dublin, Donald was chosen together with a handful of other athletes from Ireland to compete in what we call motor activities. These are activities where people who have very significant challenges are still able to compete in something, right? So everybody can do something good. This is the premise of the Special Olympics movement. Everyone has a gift. So for Donald, the, the gift is just to lift a, a bean bag, to be able to move it uh, from one side of a, of a table to the other. Uh, I found my way to the venue where he had, driv uh, had, had been driven up that morning uh, from his from his town, about five hours drive to Dublin, and brought in the wheelchair, uh, in the wheelchair van to this venue. And as it turns out, the venue was packed, which I can only attribute to the grace of the Holy Spirit and the goodness of the Irish people. Um, uh, almost a thousand people to watch athletes uh, competing in these, in these uh, very basic skills. I have to say, Tom, I got a call that morning from the president of Ireland saying she wanted to come. Uh, and watch Special Olympics competition. I said, great, we'll take her to the track and field because I knew we had athletes at track and field who were running in near Olympic times. And, and, uh, and I knew there'd be athletes from all over the world and they'd be impressive and we'd be proving that people with intellectual disabilities who you think of, you know, maybe people think of them as limited, that she would see them mm -hmm. in all their uh, elegance and glory and these gritty, very highly achieving athletes. The assistant said no, she decided she wanted to go to the motor activities. And uh, to be honest, I was worried. I'm taking the president of the country to this event. I mean, she's not going to she's not going to be impressed. They're not dunking basketballs. They're, they're not, not dunking basketballs. They're not running 400s. They're not swimming uh, medleys. She's going to see these people with the most severe disabilities. I thought to myself, this is not going to work well. Well, Donald was the first competitor, and uh, he came out onto the stage. Uh, his coach wheeled him out. His parents I had not met, but they were in the audience, mom and dad. And uh, he was, uh, the, the gun sounded, and lift, lift the bag. Um, and he kind of took the room in and, uh, and then started to his task, and it was clear. I was sitting there with the president. I was anxious, um, almost in the front row, and it was clear his arm wasn't working. You know, he just couldn't get it to go. And there's a thousand people watching. There's a thousand people and it's silent. And, uh, and you could see him efforting, but his arm just wouldn't go. And a minute goes by, nothing, no motion, no movement. I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, you know, here's the president. She's come here to see what we've done all over the world and here's what she's seeing. Um, uh, and uh, at about uh, a minute and a half, his hand moved just the slightest bit. Well, um, at, a, at 18 minutes, Donald Page finished his lift. Uh, and by the time he finally got his hand on that bag and began to move it, we're now into 10 and 12 minutes. But the place is going crazy and standing and cheering and screaming and come on lad and as I talked to his father he was describing it to me and he says you know 
He said, uh, all his life, the doctor's been telling me uh, that Donald can't do this and can't do that. And I always been telling them, he says, I give him a bit of time. Just give him a bit of time. And when he put that bag down, the president is standing, I'm standing, the whole place is standing. If the final four in a stadium of 80,000 people is noisy, this place was noisier. I'm crying, she's crying. And I thought to myself, how wrong we get it. Even uh, after so many years, I'd had it wrong. You know, I thought human greatness would be clearer, more visible in the faster time, not in the bigger spirit. Uh, so Donald, uh, you know, to me, I, I, I left Ireland thinking of all the great statesmen and women, the great poets, Haney and Yeats and Oscar Wilde and, uh, uh, you know, uh, all the great... Uh, uh, leaders of that great country, Eamon de Valera, who my mother admired and my uncle met when he was president of the United States. I mean, but there was Donald. I mean, a greater example of Irish unity, Irish courage, human bravery, the world hadn't seen, at least I hadn't. So it, it's, um, the athletes of Special Olympics, like Donald, have a way of reminding us that sometimes we get the world just upside down wrong. Uh, he gave me that moment that Haney, uh, Seamus Heaney writes of, that moment where you are caught off guard. Uh, and you can't hold it, um, but you can be reminded from time to time that the way the spirit works is not the way we think. Um, and maybe most importantly, that peace, the things we want to teach one another, will often come uh, from places we don't expect at all, uh, from, from the gifts that come from within. And, um, there's no amount of polish, there's no amount of posturing that can teach those lessons. It all has to come from authenticity. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Donald Page had it. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, uh, was moved when I read the story in the book. You and I had a conversation previously where we talked about it a little bit. Um, and I just have to tell you, you can't tell that story enough yeah. for people to get it. And I say that especially um, to you as somebody, we're competitors, right. you know, we've been teammates, uh, and you have a certain definition of, of what winning is, yeah. um, and uh, which is almost always associated with something physical, right. and something speed, and something fast, um, and you teach a lesson there. Uh, well, it's something comparative, you know, most winning requires a loser. Uh, you know, you only can say in most of the culture, I won if I beat you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to beat someone to be a winner, right? No, actually not true. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to defeat anybody. There is a kind of winning that comes without arrogance, without losers, without victims. There's a kind of winning that is uh, actually the source of all great human achievement, which is the desire to do one's best. I mean, one of the things Donald does for me is he stands in front, sits in front of a thousand people in a way that I would think is almost, for most people, humiliating. He can do, according to the world, he can do almost nothing. And if it were you or me, and I said, well, oh, I can no longer feed myself, well, I'd say, well, don't invite me to the mount, Tommy. I'm not, I, I don't have it anymore. I'm in a wheelchair now, Tommy. Don't, uh, you know, I can't give a speech anymore. I don't have a tie that fits me. I, I don't have a... My PhD is useless, my book, I, I don't remember. I mean, I'm no longer uh, fit for the world. Donald wheels in, fit for the world, unafraid. Mm. You know, what, how many, and how many times have you or I walked by him and missed him? How many times a day do we walk by one another, missing each other? Uh, how many times do we hide? You know, one of the things that came out of this book is, um, is, the, is the invitation to live in a world where you don't worry about the judgment of others. I mean, this is one of the gifts that Donald brings, that you actually uh, can be most free when you're most unafraid of the judgment of other people. Uh, if all you can do is lift that bag, my God, you can lift it beautifully. Mm -hmm. But most of us are much too terrified of, uh, of sh and, and ashamed of ourselves to trust that, not him.
Yeah, which, which goes uh, directly to a point that you make in the book that that's part of why we do spend so much of our lives not seeing people like that yeah. because it would mean that we have to identify those areas of inability that's right. or weakness in ourselves. That's right, you know? and it's terrifying to people. Yeah. It's terrifying. Yeah. No, but that's a real insight, Tim, that, yeah. uh, that helps people understand why, why do I get yeah. nervous around folks. Yeah. So it has to do with us. Yeah. It doesn't have to do with them. Right. Um, we, we all watched you just... Uh, in the last half hour with the six Special Olympians we had here at the college and um, um, you made them feel so at home uh, so quickly yeah. um, and I know that's that's part of what you do and, and the well Donald. it's also part of what they do yeah I mean I just want to be clear uh, you know you or I or the students here they're getting advanced degrees they're gonna go on to jobs they're gonna be professionals they're gonna be seen with respect and our Special Olympics athletes tend not to have any of that uh, but yet, uh, I'm most, in some ways, helped to, to relax. I mean, I, look, I, I'm, a, I'm the guy who needs this. That's why I wrote the book. I had to write this book because I needed this lesson more than other people do. I mean, other people say, well, what's the big deal about Special Olympics? I'm like, look, for me, this is a lesson I need all the time. I mean, it's like some people have yoga as a practice. Some people go have religious practices. Some people have contemplative practice. I have a Special Olympics practice because I need those athletes to remind me of what's best in me. And I need those athletes to remind me what's best in humanity. And they do it. I mean, they just have a gift. Uh, in general, people who come from great vulnerability tend to have a gift of reminding people of our great commonality. And to me, that is um, a very powerful uh, uh, help in my daily journey. Yeah. Well, it's so important for you to remind folks. Michelle's heard me tell this story. Our town, we had a young kid. Um, um, who was a Down syndrome kid, and I always said th that little guy brought more love into that town. Everybody knew him. Right. Everybody knew Michael Bender. Um, he'd run across the street to give you a hug, you know, yeah. but don't appreciate it always in that way. But as you said, as Donald's father said, just give him a bit of time. Give him a bit of time. Uh, give him a bit of time. How many, how many of us need just a bit of time, yeah. you know, and how many people get run over because we don't pause? Yeah. And it's only getting worse. Yeah. To be honest, young people are growing up now. They've got two devices. They've got three email accounts, Instagrams, Facebooks. Well, you know, they're having to, and, and it's competitive. They're trying to keep up how many likes, how many friends, how many, you know, I posted a picture, but she posted a picture and it was better. And, you know, somebody has more. And they're competing all the time. Who stops to say, just give me a bit of time? Yeah. Yeah. Let, me, let me out here a little yeah. bit. Let me relax. Let me be. Yeah. Uh, it's a very important challenge uh, for the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, that the dad knew and learned from his little boy. Yeah, uh, learned from his boy. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's another theme uh, that's partly out of the Special Olympics uh, piece of the book, Tim. But um, um, your whole, uh, and I'm going to say, preoccupation in a good way with the notion of silence. Mm -hmm. And talk a little bit about that in terms of the context of the Special Olympics movement. Yeah. Well, you know, for me, a lot of people grow up in religious families, uh, even people that don't grow up in religious families, I, I believe grew up with religious questions. What's a religious question? For me, a religious question is, does anything really matter? And that's the religious question. Does, does, does what I'm, does, do I matter? Does right and wrong matter? Does good and evil matter? Does, am I headed somewhere? It, it, or is this all meaningless? That's at, at base. So it doesn't matter what kind of where you grow up, whether you're Catholic or Jewish or Muslim or nothing or uh, Hindu or Buddhist or Methodist or Baptist, you know, you continue the list, uh, animist, it doesn't matter, you all have those questions. I was never really told that the place to answer them was within me. I thought for the longest time that some expert, a saint, a priest, a nun, a theologian, uh, somebody would answer it for me. If I could just learn more, find more, hunt for more, uh, scavenge, here's the, oh, I've got the book, or here's the poet. Um, when I was about 24, someone handed me this book called Centering Prayer, which recovered uh, the ancient tradition of the Catholic West of the practice of silence. And I remember reading the book, Tom, and I was at an age where I, I was struggling. I, I wasn't very good at my job. I was living around a lot of pain with kids and, and who were really struggling. And, and I read this book and I thought to myself, oh my God, I, I never, 
uh, you know, I never thought the spirit was within me. I never thought that the soul, as Eckhart said, the soul uh, and God are somehow one. I never thought that I could empty my head long enough to let my core breathe, my, my soul breathe. So I started practicing uh, what now some people, you know, it depends on what language you use. There's mindfulness, there's centering, there's contemplative practice. Uh, there are all kinds of different words, but they all, the, the interesting thing is all religions have within them a practice of silence. And it's the most non-hierarchical form of religion. It is the most uh, directed and unmediated connection. And it has been the lifesaver for me because I think only from a place for, I speak for myself. When I'm centered, I see. And when I'm not, when I'm distracted, when I'm buffeted, uh, I don't see. I miss what matters. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I've tried to encourage my children. Um, uh, Linda and I, you know, we built a little chapel in our house, which people think is crazy, which it probably is, but anyway, it doesn't matter old enough to do whatever I want, I suppose, right? I don't have to worry that people come in my house. Well, tonight is just, uh, as, a, as an interesting reference point, is senior skip night at our house. My, our youngest daughter is skipping school tomorrow with all of her fellow seniors. So there'll be 70 high school seniors in my basement tonight. Aren't you glad and you're And they're here? all going to be in a room like this. And right there is the chapel with a little crucifix. <laughs> I'm just thinking to myself, I hope something comes out of that chapel and keeps that house from burning down. But uh, um, so I just think the practice of silence is, and, and again, in this day and age when we are so, uh, our minds are so cluttered and distracted, uh, you talk to anybody and what they say is, geez, I'm so distracted. I got so much going on. I can't keep up. I can't keep track. Um, I want to say to all of them, there's a very difficult but powerful uh, offer to you, and it's free. Uh, close the door, as, as, uh, as, as the gospel says. Close the door. Go to your quiet space. And there, uh, you're, in the language of the gospel, your heavenly Father, who sees all things, will see you. And that's an invitation, I think, really worth um, some time, yeah, for me at least, every day. Well, and I'll, I'll uh, tell folks who are watching this that they'll, they'll want to watch the tape of your remarks uh, tonight because I know you'll talk a little bit more about that topic as well. Um, I don't think I'm going to give a talk tonight because I'm doing it all right here. <laughs> this is it. We can just show this video. Uh, no, no, no problem. Um, we can save everybody a lot of time. Uh, let me, uh, and we'll come back to some Special Olympics topics as well. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the story of your mom. Yeah. Um, um, first, like, I think people know, but I'm not sure they know just how much your dad did in his life. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe overshadowed by the the part of the family who also did wonderful things, but his last name happened to be Kennedy. But your father with the Peace Corps, the Great Society, a ton of things, a ton of things. Um, and uh, a little bit of research, people will, will be amazed uh, at the practical good work that he did. Um, but your mom, um, of course, all, all the Special Olympics. But one of the things that struck me in the book, and, and uh, I think it would be good for people to hear this kind of conversation, someone who did all the things your mother did, still felt at parts of her life, uh, as, as you uh, wrote in the book, didn't think of herself as really having been successful. Right. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it's a kind of a painful uh, thing in the book. Uh, at, her, at the end of her life, you know, my mother had worked really nonstop for the better part of 60 years. I mean, she, she obviously spent her teens and 20s in school and college and so on, and, and then got a job in juvenile delinquency. I mean, she always had a kind of a mission. She worked at the House of the Good Shepherd. Uh, she's very close to nuns her whole life and very committed to women's issues, uh, very frustrated and angry at most men, uh, including her sons and her husband, <laughs> uh, and uh, eager to prove that women had more and different and better, if you want to be honest, gifts than men. Um, but she spent 50 or so years focused on one issue, which is uh, uh, people with intellectual disabilities, their uh, unjust exclusion from social uh, value and social uh, uh, goods and services and so on. Um, I, I think she was fueled uh, by the love she had for her own sister, 
who had an intellectual disability. She was fueled by the faith that taught her never to give up. She was fueled by a lot of anger at the people who she saw as treating her sister and other people with tremendous injustice. Um, she, was treat she was fueled by her love of sport. She loved games. She loved playing. Under any circumstances, she loved to play. Um, in the end, she didn't feel like she had done what she wanted to do. And here, you know, I was with her in, in Shanghai. Uh, the president of China, which is a country which has a very painful history of treating people with intellectual disabilities, the president came to the opening ceremonies. They estimated the television audience at 100 million people in China on CCTV, 80,000 people in the stadium, fireworks to, uh, to animate uh, the whole earth. Um, and a few months later, you know, she, would, she could say, I just, I, all I did was, as she said to me, you know, I said to her, you know, you really should work on a book. Here I was saying to her, re work on a book. Uh, and she said, what would I say? I said, well, uh, you know, Mom, you, your life, your brothers, your, your own life, your career, your fight, your engagement in politics, your connection with sports figures all over the world, your fight in developing countries. And she said to me, you know, look, all I ever did was try to teach a child with intellectual disabilities to swim. And in some ways she was right. And in some ways I think all human greatness, you know, people who we admire tremendously, sometimes understand that their gift is very small. But they stick to it. You know, when she was 85, she was in the pool with people with special needs at her own house showing this is how you, this is the stroke and kick your legs harder hard you know putting them up against the wall kick 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 um, she wanted people uh, swimming was her favorite sport she wanted them to have the joy of swimming uh, there was in that simple gift such a magnitude of human and spiritual power uh, but she continued to see it in as small as possible way. You know, it reminds me a little, just thinking about it, of, you know, Teresa of the Little Flower, the, the spirituality of the small uh, is a sort of a recent, uh, in some ways, development in, in some spiritualities. But the spirituality of my little tiny flower, you know, she writes, Teresa, of being this giant field with big trees and large plants, and I'm just this little small flower. So, um, my mother uh, did extraordinary things. I mean, she was like, uh, in some ways, like a Rosa Parks or, uh, you know, from a much more vulnerable, much more marginalized, much less noticed community. Um, but she had that same unwillingness to get off uh, the seat that she wanted to, her, to, to occupy for people with intellectual disabilities. She was determined to go wherever she could to ensure that they got their chance. And uh, she thought the best way to do that was teach them to swim and show the world that they could swim. Mm. Um, well, you know, I mentioned I, I experienced um, your mother's kindness uh, and also her kick. You in, probably, in, she probably threw you in the pool. <laughs> in, 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 in being in her company. But let me just finish that piece of the conversation, Tim, and ask you, I mean, what do you think of all of these, these lessons from your mom? And I'm thinking of you describing when you were very, very young, being thrown into the pool mm -hmm. with people with disabilities, with your yeah. aunt Rosemary. Yeah. What, what's the what, what's the big lesson from from your mother and all of that for you that you carry? Well, with I you? think it, it was very simple. She just believed everybody uh, was the same. You know, she mm -hmm. just it just you just can't never. I mean, to some extent, almost too much. Get off your high horse. You know, who do you think you? I mean, I can remember my mother. If you slightly got sort of got a little bit cocky, who do you think you are? Nobody, <laughs> I promise. Uh, but it was, it was a kind of intentional uh, commitment to raising children who had, as much as she could teach it, an understanding that uh, hierarchies, that uh, elitism, that arrogance, that the belief that you're better than someone else is the most corrosive belief, not only for yourself but for others. Uh, and it's a hard one to root out. You know, let's be honest, we, we, we are all tempted. I mean, tempted to walk into a room and think, well, I'm you know, a little better than this person or not quite as good as that person. We compare ourselves to one another so much. I mean, at least I do. Maybe I'm just the only mm -hmm. nut job around, but uh, 
I think other people do it too. I think everybody we know in common has the same. <laughs> and you know. It's just our friend group. Absolutely. Everybody else has got it there, act together, except us. Um, but I think her lesson was uh, everybody has a gift, and which I have to say I think she learned uh, from her faith. And, uh, and I think the, the concomitant gift that she said was you fight with every breath uh, of life you've got to fulfill that promise and that hope that the world would, would respect that gift. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that is really what, you know, if, if you go back to the first question we talked about, which is, you know, what's the religious question? Does anything matter? Um, I think that's the answer. Yes, everybody actually matters. Yeah. Everything matters. Yeah. I mean, the Jesuits have, a, they say, you know, find God in all things. All things. Not some things, not good things, not happy things, all things. In some ways, I think that's where my mom would like to feel her lesson lay. Yeah. Well, that is a great gift, Tim. That is a great gift from your mother. We have a um, lot of work to do. I have a lot of work to do. Again, I'm... Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, I, yeah. and, and I, I felt that given my limited exposure uh, to your mother, the way that she treated me, she, yeah. she, she knew some things about my story and was very good to me. Um, I mean, one of the many examples of your mother's um, uh, kindness, of course, w was your Aunt Rosemary. Um, and I, I told you when I finished the book, it was, I, I think it was just part of the whole um, story of the larger family um, um, that your mother was a part of that yeah. just didn't fit. You know, what, yeah. what was the deal with Rosemary? Right. What's going on? And at one point you actually used the phrase, I'm not sure if it was in the book or it was another interview that I read, um, you, you, you talked about a conspiracy of kindness. Mm -hmm. um, and I, my question is, is, is that a bad thing? Well, I think what Rosemary taught, I mean, she was raised in a family of nine children with a super competitive grandfather uh, uh, and a very disciplined, uh, focused mother. And, you know, she was raised in a family that would include a president of the United States and senators of ambitious people, determined people, dedicated people. Um, and yet she, it was obvious, would never be able to succeed in that way. But this family had as much ambition as it had love. I mean, loyalty was like, whoa. You try to get in between one of those brothers and sisters and uh, it's like, you know, don't go there. Uh, they loved each other and they were committed to one another. So Rosemary kind of entered the system, if you will, in my view, in retrospect. This is just my view. I mean, there's, I have 25 plus cousins and I have um, almost a hundred se second cousins and they all have their own views of their own parents and that family, that family, uh, the Kennedy family. But my own view is that Rosemary acted as the source of compassion in that family. That in an otherwise hard driving, committed, uh, uh, very competitive family, there was this kind of leaven, um, which was Rosemary, which was okay, you, that's okay, you've won your sailboat races and you've made it at Harvard, or you're on the football team, or you got elected to this, but then there's Rosemary. Still there, doesn't really care. Doesn't really make any difference to her, whether you won the election or not. Uh, it's not gonna be her measure of success. And so I feel like at some, in some ways, uh, the Holy Spirit put that family together. And in the end, you know, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, or whether you're or raised in the 50s or 60s or, or today, what most people tend to think of when they think of President Kennedy or Robert Kennedy or Edward Kennedy or my mother, for that matter, uh, they tend to think of people who fought for the people who were outside the circle. Where did they learn that? From their own sister who was outside the circle. If you, if you, I say this in the book, if you look at ask, you know, the famous quote from President Kennedy's inaugural, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. You can't find that in Lincoln or Jefferson. You don't, it really doesn't exist in Roosevelt or Wilson. It's not really a political idea. Polit politicians historically ask people to serve their country in war. They don't tend to, then didn't tend to ask, and still don't, by the way, ask citizens to serve their country in peace. Uh, even today, mm -hmm. most governors, mayors, they don't necessarily ask people. They say, I'm going to give you tax cuts, or I'm going to give you better services, or I'm going to give you better roads or bridges, whatever it is. 
They don't say, I'm going to ask you for something, usually, because politicians, just it just doesn't come naturally to them. Where did he learn that? I, I believe the teacher was Rosemary. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, uh, at one point you, quote, you quoted uh, Pascal, and the line was, uh, the heart has its reasons yeah. that reason doesn't know. Right. And that's in a part of the book where you, you're, you're telling a story. You, you, I think you actually asked um, your Uncle Ted, because yeah. um, you, you were you know, curious about right. what, where is Rosemary right. in this tableau. Right. And you asked him, um, what was the deal with Rosemary yeah. for you, basically? Yeah. Um, can you tell that? that yeah, I, I was, I, you know, I was struggling to understand this myself, and I'm, you know, working in the Special Olympics movement, and I'm, I'm feeling my own heart cracked open, and I'm feeling changed, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, where did this really come from? You know, like, wh and why do I keep going back? Like, I, I go to these little events and gyms, and there's 50 or 75 athletes, and a handful of parents, and balls bouncing around and I'm volunteers, you know, like twice a week. And I'm like, why, why don't I get over this? Why, like, why can't I get my act together? And so I'm thinking to myself, I wonder how my, my mother, my mother or her brothers and sisters, and anyway, at this point in, in, in our family's life, my, my uncle used to come over for Sunday night dinner. And I'd go over with my kids and my wife, Linda, and we'd sit there, my dad, mom, Ted, and, uh, so I kind of, you know, they, my, my uncle was, was a wonderful man, but, you know, you didn't necessarily ask him questions he didn't want to answer. But I just felt, I, I'm going to give this a shot. So I said, you know, I, I just got a question. I just off the beaten path here, but have you ever thought about Rosemary? Because we didn't really talk about Rosemary that much. She was around, but we didn't talk about her. I said, have you ever thought about what effect she had on your life? Not, not like on the ADA or... Uh, legislation or inclusive schools or things like that or closing institutions but on you as a person and he looked up at me and he, he had this kind of uh, funny look and I thought oh god he's <laughs> he's gonna either light me up or ignore these he's like it's inappropriate I've crossed the line why you ask me these sort of and he said well he said you know I remember this one time he said we were at a party down in Palm Beach and uh, I was there, and we was a lunchtime party. All the young people were there, and he said Jack was there, and he said Uni, I think you might have been there, and uh, I was there, and we were all having a good time. And Rosie came along. Mother and Dad told us you include Rosie, and I looked up, and he he's described. I looked up, and I saw Rosemary sitting by herself at the end of the pool, and then I look over, and I saw Jack. And uh, he was talking to some pretty, very pretty girls. He had a big smile on his face. Uh, but he got up and he walked over. And he, he moved his hand. He walked over and he went over there where Rosie was. And he sat down next to her and, and he put his legs in the pool with her. And he almost sort of looked over at them. And he said, you know, I'll never, uh, I never forgot that as long as I live. Now, I don't know the date. I don't know the location. Mm -hmm. But within a year or two, Rosemary probably got the operation that uh, caused her so much pain. Her dad was trying to help her, and the uh, operation backfired. And she almost disappeared mm -hmm. out of shame. Probably 15 years later, that little young man was president of the United States, different pathways in life, one off to hiding, one to the biggest platform in the world, but a bond formed, experiences sharpened, got younger brother moved uh, in a way that, uh, that lasted. And I think sometimes, you know, Tommy, we grew up in families and we forget things, we miss things, we overlook things, but sometimes they come out at times. Uh, later, you remember what the teacher said, what your mother, your father, your next door neighbor, you remember the neighbor uh, with Down syndrome. Um, I think at some level he was remembering in that moment. Maybe he had never forgotten it, but he was remembering in that moment uh, that his older brother, who was his role model in life, his older sister, who had a very different course, that somehow their bond mm -hmm. uh, was among the most important in either of their lives. Yeah, yeah, no, very profound in the way that you, you chose to tell that, tell that in the book, Tim, as with 
probably 15 other vignettes, um, it comes home. And I think it'll come home in this interview as well. Um, I want to ask you one question about your family, and then I want to finish with just a bit more on the Special Olympics. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned I felt like you really were weaving a lot of stories in there. And yeah. when we talked about the book, and I said, how did you ever think you could do that? Yeah. And you said, Mistake. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> you, you said that you had a great editor, and yeah. I have a book by your editor yeah. on my desk now, yeah. uh, courtesy of your recommendation. Um, but you're very candid. You're very honest um, um, in, in telling your own story. And um, I knew you back um, when you were trying to figure out what is my way forward. Um, and you put 15 good years into teaching and those kind of things. But anyway, out of all that experience, you, um, instead of becoming a priest, which is a path you seriously considered for a long time, you're, uh, you and Linda are the parents of five. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I was so struck, and it came across a couple times in the book, um, I think it's very hard to write things about your children. Um, and I say that as the father of three sons. You can write to them, but it's hard to write about them. And, um, but you found a way to do this, uh, and you call it, and I just want you to talk a little bit about it, and maybe replay that one conversation, because any parents of teenagers who hear this will understand exactly what you were saying. But when you talk about how you and Linda felt like you wanted to have a curriculum of the heart as right. part of your agenda in raising right. your family, um, and then how that played out yeah. um, in, in the Unified Games thing. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, uh, the first thing is that I think parents, but also schools, um, struggle to how to teach the lessons of the heart. And I think it's high time, I mean, this is in part the next phase in my career, is to develop um, the curriculum, the school of the heart, for all kids. I mean, we want kids to be forgiving. We want them to be tolerant. We want them to be strong. We want them to be stress-free. We want them to be nonviolent. We don't teach any of it. We don't teach any of it. Parents often don't know how to do it. Uh, we want them to understand difference and be accepting of difference and understand themselves and be strong in who they are. We don't teach that. So um, we need, a, we need, a, we need a, uh, a kindergarten through 12th grade, uh, public, private, parochial schools. They all need it. Uh, we want to teach children to be peaceful. We ought to teach peace. We want to teach children to be forgiving. We ought to teach it. So for our kids, uh, okay, I'll, that soapbox. Um, uh, uh, for our kids, I think the best classroom for those lessons ends up, you're not surprised to ha have me argue this, ends up being playing on Special Olympics teams. Why? Because they learn not to ju be judgmental. They learn to be tolerant. They learn to have fun. They learn to enjoy others. They learn that they're a part of a bigger picture. I mean, they learn a lot of things, mm -hmm. bouncing around in a, in a gym with a, with a bunch of uh, kids who are all kinds of differences uh, and all kinds of things the same. But if you're raising boys, sons, daughters, uh, and it's a Saturday morning and it's 8 a.m., you're waking them up to go to Special Olympics practice, and uh, you know they're teenagers and they're nine and they don't want to go and they want to watch TV and they want to stay home, and those, you know, it, it's kind of like you don't want to beat them up too much, right? So one morning we're driving, we drive out to the practice, uh, the unified team, and we're in a small gym and I'm watching the boys and all, all five of the kids were there. And no one kinda, at this level, we're at the very beginning level, people are double dribbling and shooting at the wrong basket and there's no stands and, you know, the, it's kinda chaotic and, and I'm looking at this and I'm thinking to myself, geez, I hope I'm not, I'm not, uh, hurting my kids by forcing them to do this. I hope they're not thinking to themselves, why the heck is my dad making me do this or my mom? Uh, you know, this is a drag. I mean, and they hadn't said it, but I'm looking and I'm thinking, man, I gotta make sure I do a gut check here that this is getting through and it's not, it's not gonna backfire. So we're driving home with the two boys and the radio's blaring. Uh, and I say to them, uh, Tim and Sam, I say, you know, what do you think of this whole Special Olympics thing? You know, they, of course, they're boys, and it's Saturday morning, and they're driving home on the radio. They're like, it's fine. Fine, Dad. I'm like, no, no, seriously. What do you, are you, are you, are you getting anything out You're of this? You're trying to have a serious conversation. I'm trying to have a serious right? conversation with, you know, a 12-year-old and a 15-year-old boy on a Saturday morning in the car with the radio on. They're like, it's fine, Dad. It's fine. So I turn off the radio, and they're like, why did you do that? I was like, because I need an answer. I want to know what you think about this Special Olympics stuff. Uh, Sam turns and says, look, Dad. He's the 12-year-old. He's the 12-year-old. 
He says, look, Dad, it's like this. If you said to me, let's go to Disney World, I'd say that's the most fun I could have. I would be so excited. We'd go on roller coasters, we'd go on rides, we'd be in the hotel. It would be beautiful, the weather would be great, it would be the best thing. And he says, there's only one problem, I have no idea what he's talking about. I've asked him about Special Olympics, we're driving on the highway, he's telling me about Disney World. He says, there's only one problem, when you get home, it's terrible. Because you're so upset that your vacation's over, and then you got to go back to school, and it sucks. <laughs> I'm looking at him like, what is he talking about? And he goes, when we go to Special Olympics, it's like, that's the kind of fun that lasts. Fun that lasts. And then he says, now turn the radio back on, Dad. I answered your question. I was like, yeah, you really answered. I thought to myself, wow, I never heard that. Here's a little man, a little boy. He's already somehow learned that there are two different kinds of fun. Because he didn't say that Disney World wasn't fun. He just said it's a certain kind. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't last. He's right. Mm -hmm. You can go on the roller coaster for a day, a week, a month, but sooner or later it's over. But he also understood that when you're in a space like that place where the ball's bouncing around, and the only thing I can describe it as is a place, again, of no judgment. Everybody's just having fun. That kind doesn't have an expiration. You can keep that. Mm -hmm. You can live that way. Yeah. You can have fun of that kind, and it lasts. It doesn't end on Sunday night when you got to go to work on Monday morning yeah. or at the end of your vacation. So, I mean, again, I, only, I, I attribute these lessons to, um, to the athletes, the teachers. Uh, only they could have created that environment. Mm -hmm. They didn't created by being the victims of disability. They didn't create it by being the source of somebody else's charity. They created it by being recklessly open and trusting the world. And even though the world has treated them so badly, treating everybody that walks in mm -hmm. like a pal. Mm -hmm. Big lessons. Yeah, pretty profound, 12 years old. Um, just two more questions, um, and we'll bring it back to, to Special Olympics. Um, one is, there's a, a point in the book, and I think your, your mother and yourself, you're in South Africa. I, I think that you're having the World Games there. I, I can't remember exactly. But you're, you're having a conversation. You really read this book. I really read this book. Um, and as Michelle Either that can or you have you, good staff members. No, and as Michelle can tell you, I don't, I don't read uh, many books like this. I really don't. And, uh, but no, I did read it. In fact, I was frantic, Tim, uh, this week because my copy is all marked up. And I gave it to somebody. I don't know who I gave it to. So all, all of these examples, I that's right, <laughs> I, I couldn't find. Um, but fortunately, I had given it to Michelle and she'd written down the pages where I had marked up, so I was able to find it myself. But this was one of the things that I noted. Um, you felt very much when you're having this conversation with Nelson Mandela that, um, that it was awkward, you know, that you, you weren't asking the question right, you know, kind of thing. You, 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 you criticize yourself in the book for the way you phrased the question. Um, uh, but I, I, obviously the important thing is the answer that he came out with. And you were asking him the question in the book, yeah. you know. But you were asking it of him in the context of his life, right. you know. How can you be so obviously fully alive right. with what you endured in your yeah. life? Right. And, and can you say a little bit about his... Well, it's, I mean, it's exactly the question. I, was, uh, I didn't have the fully alive language then, but I just, I see this man. And we all did. The whole world saw this man. I mean, all you have to do is look at the picture of him walking out of the prison after 27 years. His face is alive. His eyes are bright. His smile is huge. I mean, it's undeniable that this, there's an energy coming out of this man that just is like otherworldly, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and the history is clear. I mean, he, the first lunch he has is with the guy who put him in prison. I mean, come on. It sounds like a good Hollywood movie, but it's not real life, is it? No one does that. 27 years, his knees destroyed, his marriage destroyed, missing his children, pain, physical punishment. 27 years, not two, not seven, 27 years behind those bars on his own in solitary with nothing and he walks out and the first thing he does is go to find the guy who put him in and say, let's have lunch. I mean, I, can't, I still can't. So I met him. Uh, he, he, he fell in love with the Special Olympics movement. He came to our games and 
And he invited, after one of these large events down in South Africa, he invited my mother and I and my colleague John Dow over to his house for tea. And I was like, oh my God, this is like the thrill of a lifetime. Uh, and it was. And we're sitting in a small room like this, just kind of with, and he's sitting there and he's, but I, I, I just want to say to him, I don't know how to ask this question, but how the heck do you get to be like you? <laughs> you know, like, how do you, how do you do that? How do you become someone that has that much uh, openness to the world, that much joy? And he answered very, he said, oh, he says, it's, it's very simple. He says, it's just humility uh, and simplicity. He says, all of us in prison learned it. You know, he's very, I had a big smile, all of us in prison learned it. He says, it's humility because uh, you realize in prison uh, that it's not about you, that it's about something much bigger than you. And he says it's simplicity because you learn, also learn in prison, you need almost nothing to be happy. So he says if you have this, he says, he says, he says you have this and all these athletes are showing you this, aren't they? I thought, well, I guess they are. Uh, but, I mean, over the year since he said that, it still it deepens in me over and over again, the humility piece. Um, it's not about you. It's not about, I mean, we are so told it's about us. Mm -hmm. But Mandela knew it wasn't about him, and that's what made him powerful enough to move everybody, because he knew it wasn't about, you know, he had gotten all that ego, all that greed, all that selfishness, all that anger, it all just left him. And when all that stuff leaves you and you realize you're here for a larger purpose, oh my goodness, the lights just start to come out of you. You know, it's not coming on you. You don't need lights. Yeah. Uh, you start to radiate it. And then when you add that to the, the, the simplicity gift, the, the, the understanding that you don't need anything else to be happy than, other than who you are, what you've got, you really don't. You think you do, you think you need a new car, you think you need a drink, you think you need a friend, you think you need a this, you think you need a new iPhone, you think you need a grade, you think you need a job. He's kind of like, if you know you don't need any of that, then you're free. Yeah. Humility and simplicity. Um, last question, Tim, just um, going forward, Special Olympics, yeah. what are you... I mean, I think we're just scratching the surface as a movement. I think uh, I'd like to see a revolution in American sport where, uh, you know, there was a time, Tom, uh, 40 years ago, people don't even remember it, where if you went to a, an American high school, there'd be a boys' basketball team, a boys' football team, a boys' baseball team, there'd be no girls' sports. And all of a sudden, we passed a law called Title IX. It, it, the whole thing changes, and it's a revolution in the way women see themselves in schools, their roles as creating school culture, their roles in developing themselves physically, learning the gifts of teamwork and, and, and physical training that comes from sport. I mean, we take it for granted that women have the same uh, chances to play sports as men. Uh, we don't take it for granted that someone with Down syndrome does. I'd love to see every American school have a men's basketball team, a women's basketball team, and a Special Olympics unified basketball team that's uh, treated the same as every other team that plays interscholastic sports, that gets letters, that has assemblies, that has pep rallies, that has newspaper stories written about it, where the guy who's four foot eleven, uh, and uh, you know, is is a is a is a star of the school. I, I'd love to see every school in America have that. And if you want me to go further, I'd love to see every school in the world have what we call unified. Now, unified is the traditional Special Olympics model of people with intellectual challenges playing on teams. But half of the team is non-disabled kids, what my kids were, were playing, and what Sam learned, and Timbo, and my daughters Rose, and Kathleen, and Caroline. They all played on unified teams from the time they were seven years old, shaping them, molding them, inviting them into a deeper sense of themselves and others. I think that's a learning experience that every school should have. And when the Special Olympics movement is in every school in the United States, and in as many schools around the world as we can possibly reach, then I think we'll see a tipping point, and finally, we will not be trying to end intolerance. We will not be trying to end the bigotry, the indifference, the horrible injustice visited upon people who appear different. We will instead have educated children in welcome, in diversity, in tolerance, 
an injustice. And I think at that point we will be able to say that schools are finally doing their job. I mean, the very, very uh, qualities you described earlier that um, we don't have a way of teaching. Right. And this would be a way to do that. And that is what your one of your sons is doing now out in that's California. Right. Yeah. Uh, working on And that that's what you're doing here campaign. at the Mount. Uh, yeah. And that's why I'm proud to be here. Uh, thank you, Tim. I want to thank Tim Shriver for being with us for this digital conversation. I'm um, so happy that he ended on that note because it's not an accident that someone of Tim's character is here um, at Mount Aloysius. It, it is who we try to be about here. Um, and uh, ever since uh, seven uh, brave and hardy Sisters of Mercy came through a pass in the mountains here 162 years ago and started a school uh, because at the time, as you just described, Tim, nobody was educating young girls. Right. And today um, we are open to uh, folks of all kinds of needs. We still have 60% of our students are first generation of college here. Um, and we're teaching them uh, so that they're ready for jobs. But as I said, when I started this job, Tim, I said, we really want our students to graduate uh, with uh, uh, three things. One, to be job ready. They have to be able to go to work uh, with the incomes that they come from. Two, to be technology ready, to keep the job. They've got to be up to speed on technology. But three, to be community ready. And that's always been the mission of this school, um, that uh, we uh, go back to the communities where we're from or where we're going to build our lives and we engage in positive and productive ways. Thank you for being such a good example of that, Tim, and for being with us today. To be here. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm.